Good morning, West Side. May I be the first one to welcome you this morning uh, and to this beautiful first December, for not first December, but first December and Sunday morning. You know, today as we light our first candle, uh, that candle represents hope and what that hope is and what it means to us. The hope that God gave us when his son came into the world the hope that Jesus gave us when he died for our sins. So today, if you would, as we, before we start our first hymn, we're going to stand and read our responsive reading for Go Tell It on the Mountain. It says, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see the things that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So he hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told him as child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So if you would, our first hymn for today is 182, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Let's lift it up for him this morning. Go! Welcoming you all on this beautiful Lord's Day that he has blessed us with. Thank you so much for being in the Lord's house today. Isaiah 9, 2 says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. And then again in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 16, The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Well, 
this morning, uh, we have lit the candles of hope and preparation. For centuries, God's people hoped for the coming of the Messiah. Well, we rejoice today that the Messiah has come in the person of Jesus Christ, and we celebrate that especially at Christmas time. And so I'm thankful that you are here today to do that very thing. And now we hope also in his second coming, amen, uh, where he will establish his kingdom and make all things right one glorious day. And hope in God does not disappoint, for the Lord fulfills all of his promises. Now throughout this month, there'll be no children's church, and so the kids can be among you this month, and no bus ministry for the month of uh, December as well. Let us prepare ourselves to worship the Lord Jesus Christ today. Pray with me, if you will. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another Lord's Day that you have blessed us with. I thank you for the people that are here today, Lord, to worship you and help us to do so in spirit and in truth. And God, go before us and prepare our minds and hearts. Speak to us, even in this unique service of the decorating of the Christmas tree. And Lord, may we be that light this Christmas that others need to see. May we be that bell ringing that others need to hear that there is hope in you our Lord Jesus Christ. We worship you today. Lord, be with each person in each pew. There are unique circumstances in each life that need your touch and your strength and your healing, O Lord. And so minister unto us individually and also, Lord, collectively as a group here this morning. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ and all of his children said together, Amen. Amen.
2019 marks a hundred years that Southern Baptist Offering for International Missions has been called the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. You probably know that 100% of the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering goes directly overseas to support IMB missionaries serving around the world. 0% goes to overhead and administrative cost. Every penny goes directly to IMB missionaries to declare the majesty of Christ to a lost world. Inspired by a spirit of a gospel-driven partnership, the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering is an effective initiative that God is using to extend His work in a world that desperately needs to hear that Christ died for the forgiveness of sin because of the mercy and grace of God. So why is the offering named after Lottie Moon? Well, simply put, she started it. Charlotte Lottie Diggs Moon was appointed as a missionary to China by the Foreign Mission Board, later known as IMB, at the age of 33. She spent a total of 39 years laboring for the cause of Christ in China. One of the key distinctives that made Lottie special was her ability to relate to two worlds. The Chinese world, where she effectively ministered, and the Western world, where she inspired hearts and challenged her constituents through the persuasive power of her writing. In 1885, after serving in China for 12 years and at the age of 45, Lottie moved inland to the city of Pingtu so she could be a full-time evangelist, believing there was no greater joy than leading another to faith in Christ. She immediately saw the need for more full-time workers and began to communicate the needs to her constituents back home. On September 15, 1887, Lottie penned an open letter to Southern Baptist women pleading for more workers specifically asking that a week be set aside for prayer and for a special offering to be taken for new missionary appointments. Her letter was published in the Foreign Mission Journal the following December. A year later, in 1888, the Woman's Missionary Union was formed and a week in December was set aside for prayer and for offerings. The goal was $2,000, which would be enough to appoint two new female missionaries. In the end, more than 3,000 was given, resulting in the appointment of three new missionaries. Lottie Moon's letters were effective because she embodied the type of sacrifice that she called others to make. When severe famine hit China around 1912, she used her own money and belongings to provide for the needs of many. Giving all she had to ease the pain of others, Lottie died on Christmas Eve in 1912 at the age of 72 due to severe starvation. She lived a life of self-denying sacrifice. In 1919, the missions offering that Lottie Moon started in 1888 was named in her honor. Today, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering supports almost 3,700 missionaries serving around the world. In a letter written to Southern Baptist women, Moon expressed her theology of giving. Lottie writes these words, I wonder how many of us really believe that it is more blessed to give than to receive. A woman who accepts that statement of our Lord Jesus Christ as a fact and not as impractical idealism will make giving a principle of her life. She will lay aside sacredly not less than one-tenth of her income of her earnings as the Lord's money, which she would no more dare to touch for personal use than she would to steal. How many there are among our women, alas, alas, who imagine that because Jesus paid it all, they need pay nothing, forgetting that the prime object of their salvation was that they should follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ in bringing back a lost world to God, and so aid in bringing the answer to the petition our Lord taught His disciples, Thy kingdom come. We all need to hear this message. Jesus paid it all so that we could gain everything. Christ's death on the cross paid the penalty of sin so that those from every nation, all tribes and peoples and languages can be reconciled to God and one day stand before His throne. And now as the redeemed children of God and His ambassadors to the world, we have been commanded to actively participate in Christ's Great Commission work. Christ made the ultimate sacrifice to accomplish the work of God. We are to follow His example and surrender all that we are for His glory and praise. Lottie Moon isn't the name of a clever marketing campaign. It marks the legacy 
of a giant who followed Christ with full surrender and championed others to do the same. Good morning, everyone. So, as you've seen in the video, um, it's now time again for us uh, to embark upon the season of the Lottie Moon Christmas World Missions Offering. So these very nice prayer guides have been available to you today. If you did not get one, uh, there will be some more in the back or in the foyer as well. Um, these are so nicely laid out so that you can see every single day, and it's labeled by the day, what you can specifically pray for to support this missions effort. Um, Dr. Paul Chitwood, who is president of the Inter International Missions Board, said this, missionaries are addressing the world's greatest problem with the only solution, God's solution, the gospel. But they need your prayers, your support, and your continued generosity and more workers in the harvest. Um, some numbers for you. Because of this steadfast presence among the nations, there are 3,521 missionaries and 95 global missionary partners. Um, they were able to engage in 67 new people, groups, and places and see approximately 178,177 people come to Christ just this year. Um, this can only happen if we continue to work together to raise more missionaries and champion this Lottie Moon offering and the cooperative program. So this week and through Christmas, be much in prayer and consider what you might give to this offering. So this year, our church goal is $3,000. And of course, you can give online or starting next week, the little envelopes designated for the Lottie Moon offering will be available in your pews. So let's pray and let's do our part so that others might come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And we know that this world needs the gospel and this world needs Jesus. And it's the responsibility of every single child of God to do their part so that the gospel of Jesus Christ will be shared all around the world. Thank you for your prayers, and may God richly bless you as you pray and give so that others might be saved from sin, death, and an eternity separated from God in heaven. At this time, Brother Jason Mays is going to come and lead us in a special prayer. Before I pray, I was struck by the inside your pamphlet. 173,451 people die lost every day. That's a lot. Mm. One's too many. Mm. Join me in praying. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for the opportunity to come here today. We thank you for the opportunity to praise your name, but also to be about your work, Father. Uh, to honor you with giving, uh, to just to be your hands and feet, Father. We pray for those missionaries that are out doing your work right now, uh, some in places we couldn't imagine being. Uh, you've pricked their heart and sent them in places uh, where you, your word needs to be spread, Father, and uh, that while that is globally, there are some areas where no, no one has ever been, uh, no one has spoke your name. We pray for those that are actively reaching those people, reaching out to those people. We pray for those right now that uh, you've pricked their heart to to lead them to be missionaries and they're, they're struggling with that decision. We ask you to be with those and clear, give them a clear vision of what you have ahead of them. Father, we thank you for all that you do. We ask you to be with us, guide us, strengthen us, and no matter what our part to play, Father, whether it be to financially give or uh, to be out there being your hands and feet, Father, we, we pray for your, your will to be done. Father, forgive us where we fail. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> 
as we continue in our worship today, our next uh, hymn, our offertory hymn, is going to be from Lamentations 3.24. It says, The Lord is my portion, therefore I will put my hope in him. And it is in Christ alone that we find hope. So with that, let us stand. It will be on 506. We will sing all four verses of In Christ Alone. Let's lift it up. In Christ Alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest. reminder there are four ways to give we have uh, the on site the little church in the back there we have the uh, church app on the website and we have the, uh, the mail of course let's go to the Lord in prayer God our Father we thank you for this day we thank you for the health and the freedom and the right mind to be here today Lord Lord we pray your bless this offering bless the ones who give um, the ones who give out of just like the widows might, Lord. They give in faith. Pray that you'll be with this church and our leaders to use this money and spend it towards uh, your kingdom and your glory. And we trust you with it. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>
Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 13 says, The glory of Lebanon will be yours, the forest of firs, pines, and box trees, to beautify my sanctuary. My temple will be glorious. Today, we worship in a unique way through the decorating of the Christmas tree. For today's service, instead of a traditional message, the Christmas tree is the center of our festivities and our message. The Christmas tree, along with other greenery, is beautifying our church this Christmas season, isn't it? And one of the most universal features of Christmas time is the use of evergreens for decoration. The early Christians placed greenery in their windows to indicate that Christ had entered the home. Now, although ours are artificial, the greenery shows that pines and firs don't change color. They are evergreen and ever alive, even during the wintertime. They symbolize the unchanging nature of God, and they remind us of the everlasting and abundant life that is ours through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, however, this is not just going to be a traditional or regular Christmas tree, but it is the Christmon tree. It is a Christ tree. And so today we will decorate the Christmon tree with ornaments that are symbols which speak to us of God the Father, and God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. And these symbols will provide a picture of the salvation that has been provided for us through Jesus Christ that we celebrate at Christmas time, but also that we celebrate each week that we join to worship. Now, each of you, I hope, has a Christmas tree. Does everybody have a, or a Christmas ornament? Does everybody have a Christmas ornament? Does anyone not have a Christmas ornament? Raise your hand. Many, Alan? Okay. Jason, will you take mine? One of the, you got one? Okay. And some of you have two. Some of you might have three. And we've got uh, at least three of each ornament, and that is why. And so it is for all of us to participate in. Okay, thank you. Any others? Okay. So each of you, uh, uh, again, have more than one. And you'll see on the screen, when Paula begins to read in a moment, you'll see a picture put up of each ornament. And one of our fine readers will read the meaning behind your ornament. And so when you see uh, your ornament that you have in your hand on the screen, we ask that you come up from your pew and place it on the tree while the reader is reading its meaning. And we'll have people to help you. Uh, Brother Pat and Sister Michelle is going to be up here to kind of help if uh, we'd love for you to come up to the, to the tree if you can. If you can't, if you can just come to the altar, that's fine as well. They'll be there to help you and help place ornaments on the tree. And we got a good six foot three path there or four, whatever he is, to, to help with some of those taller ornaments as well. And so please, uh, when you see your ornament, bring it to the altar or the tree. So let us use this service today to worship together and to celebrate our salvation that God has provided for us through the first coming of Jesus Christ. I pray that you're encouraged today. I pray that you're comforted today. And may the Holy Spirit give you peace as we do this together as a family and we proclaim our salvation and that we proclaim that Jesus Christ has come, born of a virgin, to save us from our sin. Let's begin decorating the Christmas tree. The Alpha and Omega. As the first and last of the Greek alphabet, the Alpha and Omega represent the one in whom creation began and by whom it will one day end. Its usage as an early Christian symbol is based upon Revelation 1, 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty.
the anchor. As a symbol of hope, the anchor is one of the most ancient of all Christian symbols. Its usage is based upon the Apostle Paul's words in Hebrews 6.19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. The anchor is one of the oldest inscriptions to be found in the catacombs, dating back to the second century. During times of persecution, the anchor took the shape of a cross to those who knew its hidden meaning. The angel. The symbol of an angel blowing a trumpet is primarily used to represent the second coming of Christ. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. It also signifies the announcement of the birth of Christ to the shepherds watching their flocks in the hills outside Bethlehem. The Ark of the Covenant. Also known as the Ark of the Testimony, was a wooden chest clad with gold containing two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments as well as according to various texts within the Hebrew Bible, Aaron's rod and a pot of manna. May we always hold those Ten Commandments within our heart as gold that clad the walls of that chest. The bell. A bell is often used to call people to worship. This chrismon symbolizes the sounding forth of God's word and serves as a reminder that God should have first priority in our lives. The Bible. The Bible was written under divine guidance and is the very breathing word of God. Bible theology is crucial for the health of the church because the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Ephesians 2.20. Additionally, the word upon which the church is built is both living and life-giving. Psalms 119, 25 and 50, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and Hebrews 4, 12. It is the record, the deposit and the testimony of God's good news in Jesus Christ. Good morning, guys. To me. The budded cross. The budded cross is symbolic of the young Christian who has just begun serving Christ. Like a bud, young believers are considered immature Christians. The butterfly. The butterfly has long been a symbol of life after death. The remarkable transformation that takes place during the metamorphosis from caterpillar to butterfly beautifully illustrates the promise found in 1 Corinthians 15:52. The dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The candle. A candle and the light it produces is symbolic of both God the Father 
and Jesus Christ, his son. Light is also to be a distinct characteristic of all those who claim Christ as Lord. The Apostle John wrote, This is the message we have heard from him and declare it to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. It's 1 John 1 5. Jesus claimed the same quality for himself when he stated, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John 8, 12. The chalice or cup represents the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who poured out his life for the forgiveness of our sins. The cup also reminds us of the sacrament of Holy Communion. The Cairo. In the original Greek text, the word Christ, it was written X-R-I-S-T-O-S. The letters C-H-I, the X, and the R-H-O, R or P, they were combined into one of the earliest known Christian symbols. It has been found inscribed on the walls of Roman catacombs dating back to the second century. In Hebrew, the word Christ is translated Messiah, which means the anointed one. Circle and triangle. This chrismon combines a circle and a triangle to form a unique symbol of eternity and the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Cross and the Crown. A crown has always been a visible symbol of a ruler's power and authority. For Christians, the crown symbolizes the ultimate sovereignty and majesty due to the Son of God. At his return, Jesus will be crowned with many crowns and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation 19, 12, 16. The daisy. Toward the end of the 15th century, the daisy became a popular symbol for the innocence of the holy child. When Mary questioned the angel, the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy child shall be called the Son of God. Luke 1.32 The dove. The dove symbolizes peace, safety, and God's desire for reconciliation with mankind. The dove is commonly seen in Christian art with Mary as a symbol of care, devotion, purity, and peace. In this motherly light, the dove elicits a promise of hope and salvation. The Epiphany Star. 
This familiar symbol is best known at the, Christian, at the Christmas season because of its appearance to the wise men at the birth of Christ. Matthew records, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Matthew 2, 9 through 10. The Evergreen Tree. Legends say that the branches of an evergreen tree dusted with snow were used indoors and were decorated with candles lighted in honor of the birth of Jesus. The, the green color refers to an act of glorifying God for his creation in nature. Needle-like leaves of evergreens pointed toward heaven reminding us to reach to God and to be fostered by the water of his love. The evergreen represents the tree of life. The fish or ichthus. In its early years, Christianity was an illegal re religion. Because of this, the sign of the fish became a universal symbol that secretly identified believers to one another. The Greek, the Greek word for fish is ichthus, and when spelled in Greek, these five letters were also the first letters of the word Jesus, Christ, God's Son, and Savior. By, sell, by drawing the sign of the fish, Christians reveal both their identity and the basis of their faith. The Globe. The Globe is to remind us as we read in Matthew 5, 5 and 6, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The grapes. Wheat from the fields is made into bread and grapes from the vineyard are made into wine, the symbols of Christ's broken body and blood poured out for us on the cross. These are the sacraments for communion. The harp was the favorite instrument of King David. And David and all Israel played before God with all their might and was singing with the harps. Harps are also mentioned by John in his description of music to be played in heaven. For Christians, the harp symbolizes all music which is sung or played for the glory of God. The Lamb. This symbolic Lamb of God is also known by its Latin name, Angus Dei. John chapter 1 verse 29 records that upon seeing Jesus coming toward him, John the Baptist exclaimed, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. The Lamb, pure and faultless, was used as the preferred sacrifice in the Old Testament. Only Jesus, however, could ever truly be the perfect sacrifice for the sins of mankind. David wrote, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In ancient times, an oil lamp provided the most common means of illumination for those traveling after dark. Symbolically, the Bible, as, God word, as God's word, provides mankind with the only reliable source of the true spiritual light.
The lion, this symbol of Christ is based on John's message in Revelation 5.5. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. Medieval symbolism frequently represented Jesus in this way. Even C.S. Lewis, in his famous series, The Chronicles of Narnia, portrays Christ as the noble lion Aslan. Courage, power, and kingship are all attributes which rightfully characterize the Son of God. Maltese Cross. The eight points of the four arms of the Maltese Cross symbolize the eight obligations or aspirations of a Christian. To live in truth, to have faith, to repent one's sins, to give proof of humility, to love justice, to be merciful, to be sincere and wholehearted, to endure persecution. Manger. The manger reminds us to be humble and represents the simplicity of the birth of, and life of Jesus. A reminder of the night our Savior was born to die so that we might live forever in the presence of God. The nails. The nails are a reminder of the crucifixion of our Lord. Through his suffering, we were given eternal life. May we never forget the great sacrifice of our Savior, who was put on this earth to live and die for our sins. Rose of Sharon. I am the Rose of Sharon and the Lily of the Valleys. Song of Solomon 2 1. Seashell and scallop. Seashell and scallop is a symbol for Christian baptism or the baptism of Jesus. It is also a symbol for pilgrimage and the spread of the gospel to the world. The Shepherd of Love. This gently flowing contemporary design symbolizes Jesus' words found in John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The staff represents our shepherd's care and protection. The heart symbolizes his great love. The cross is where this love and concern culminated in Christ's sacrifice for our sins. And here's how to measure it. The greatest love is shown when a person lays down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you obey me. John chapter 15 verses 13 through 14. The ship, deep within the ancient catacombs of Rome, are to be found drawings of a ship riding through troubled waters, the cross emblazoned on its sail. As a symbol of the church, the ship reminded early Christians that in spite of persecution from without and heresy within, the Church of Christ and those faithful to her would safely reach their heavenly home.
the sword. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians 6, 17. In 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Treasure. In Matthew 6, 20 through 21, we read, Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Watchtower. The Watchtower is a symbol of protection from enemies. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and are safe. Proverbs 18:10. No doubt many of us are thinking about what to give another person that is special to us in our lives. Nothing wrong with that. I've done the same and will continue to do so. But let us also, as a church, as individual Christians, also think, what does God want from me this Christmas season? What does God want me to, to give or to do, to make amends, to be more resolved in my commitment to him, whatever it might be, true and pure worship. What can I give him, poor as I am? I give him my heart, as we will sing in a moment. And so, in a few moments, as we sing that part in him, let that be a wonderful prayer. What will make this Christmas uh, special? Well, on the back of your bulletin, you'll see uh, at least six ways I've listed that uh, maybe some extra things that you can do to be devoted to Christ this season. Uh, starting tomorrow, also check your emails. There will be a daily uh, Advent devotional email coming to you each day throughout Christmas Eve. And don't forget about our Christmas Eve services. We are having Sunday school that morning at 10. And worship at 11 o'clock. But I pray that you will look through some of those things and take heed. I'll also say this, that our Wednesday evenings, I'm working hard to prepare uh, good lessons, good messages. I'm doing my best with the Spirit's help. And so maybe if you're not used to coming out on Wednesday night, at least through Christmas, uh, come to a couple of our Wednesday night uh, devotions uh, through Christmas and prepare your heart. Uh, before Brother Steve comes and offers our benediction and then we have our parting hymn of what can I give him, I want to remind you there's no Sunday evening services all throughout this month. The choir is practicing tonight at 5.30. Oh, the choir's practicing after services today. And so the kids are still practicing tonight at 5. All right, kids are practicing tonight at 5. And uh, we'll be having our Christmas cantata on the 17th of this month. And then also the kids play will be at 5.30 that evening of December the 17th as well. Other than that, no Sunday evening services throughout the month of December. Brother Steve, if you will, come and thank the Lord for this day. And then we'll have our parting hymn. May God bless your Sunday. May God bless your Christmas season. Let us pray.
Most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that we can come into your house today, Lord, and praise your name and worship you, Lord. We just thank for each individual here today, Lord, that uh, be with them throughout this week. Uh, we, we love you, and we just thank you so much for these many, many blessings that you give us. Just uh, this service today that hopefully will remain in our heart and remain in our mind and be able to minister to others in our community, Lord. We just pray for that opportunity, Lord, and please, if there's somebody around us that does not know your saving grace, Lord, that give us strength to tell them about you, Lord. We just thank you again for each individual. Be uh, Watch over and protect them. Bring them back at the next appointed uh, service. We just thank you for our Brother Allen as he leads us and be with those, that family. Be with the ones that have lost the loved ones, Lord, uh, in our church. We just want to pray for those families, keep them strong. The ones that are sick at the hospitals, wherever they might be, be with the doctors and nurses and touch their, their lives. We just thank you for each person today here, Lord. Be with them and protect them, lead, guide, and direct them in each thing that we do. Please forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, and for his sake, amen.